Good evening, everyone. My name is Viral Miles, and on behalf of the Catholic University of America School of Law, I want to invite you to the second program in our series entitled Critical Insights in Law and Law Practice. We've been hosting these at the National Press Club, I think now for four years, and we have two more in the lecture series that will be here. Um, one will be in April, and we will focus on uh, current issues uh, concerning um, ERISA. And in May, we will have a program that will focus on liberty, uh, religious liberty under President Obama. Now, today's program, Environmental Justice, Hearing Communities Through the Economic Den, will allow us to focus our attention on environmental issues of justice and fairness. Our panelists are going to examine what the weakened economy of recent years has meant for the important environmental justice initiatives, with particular attention given to low-income and minority communities here in the United States and in developing nations. They are going to consider how environmental justice principles can be effectively advanced and applied in weak economic times. This is, of course, a very important and timely discussion, and I want to take this opportunity to extend a very special thanks to Alex Dunn for organizing today's program. Professor Dunn is an alumna of our law school, and she is also a lecturer in law. Uh, during the day, she serves as the executive director and general counsel of the Association of Clean Water Administrators, and she has 16 years of experiment, experience in environmental law and policy. And I have to tell you, I remember when, uh, when Alex was the editor-in-chief of our law review, and it's really hard to believe uh, that that time has passed. She hasn't changed, but I clearly have. Um, she has worked uh, extensively on water quality, water treatment, and implementation of the Clean Water Act for many years. I would like to also take this opportunity to thank our co-sponsors for today's program for their support and assistance in getting the word out about what we're doing here today. And that includes the District of Columbia Bar's Environment, Energy, and Natural Resources section, the Environmental Law Institute, the Women's Council on Energy and the Environment, and the American Bar Association section of Environment, energy and resources. Now Alex is always on top of everything and I was very grateful that she pointed something out to me that I didn't really think about today or think to look at but today's uh, program is timely for another reason that is special to our university. Um, it just so happens that environmental justice is the focus of Pope Benedict's general intention prayer for the month of February access to water, that all peoples may have access to water and other resources needed for daily life. I think that's an appropriate way to begin our program, and I turn it over to Alex Dunn. Thank you, Dean Miles. Well, it's wonderful to be with all of you this afternoon, and I, I thank uh, Dean Miles. It's, it's kind of like when you um, grow up and you can't call your parents friends by their first names. I, I still have to call her Dean Miles uh, because when, when uh, she was my professor, that, that was the, the term of respect which she has well earned. Uh, she's a wonderful leader of the law school and it's delightful to be here. I see some of the students in my um, advanced topics in environmental law seminar out there and, and see other good friends who have helped us get the word out about this really great program that we're so excited about today. Um, I wanted to sort of open the program with some reflections to sort of get you in the environmental justice mindset. I have two very good uh, friends um, that teach at the University of Oregon, not to mention another law school, but John Bonine. And um, just only two weeks ago, he lost his wife, who was also a professor, Svetlana Kravchenko. They have written the first law school text on human rights and the environment. And uh, I've used that book to teach from, and it's a wonderful resource. And in their introduction, they say, 
Good advocates are those whose eyes are wide open, not only to alternative legal arguments, but to the humanity of those around them. And it, it really speaks about environmental justice, is that once your eyes are open to the needs and the challenges of communities in our own country, in developing countries, um, their desire for clean water, uh, open space, healthy environments for their children, economic opportunity, and, and really the chance to control the communities in which they live, once your eyes are open to those communities, you really can't ever think about environmental challenges in the same way because you can't put them in a box anymore. You have to open the circle of people who you need to consult when you make decisions. And that's really what environmental justice has become as the movement has evolved since its early days, at least in the United States in the early 70s and 80s. You have to know that environmental justice, as many of our speakers will say, is not a term that you can define. It's a very distinct term for each community. So remember that this is about communities. And you'll hear from our speakers that what environmental justice means in one community, whether it's a tribal nation in the middle of America concerned about power lines crossing their lands, could be very different than what environmental justice means to an urban minority population that might be fishing in an urban river that actually has high levels of toxics. So we have to realize that when we talk about environmental justice, it can be frustrating because as lawyers, it's nice to be able to clearly define what we're talking about. And this is one of those issues because it involves people that is difficult to always bound. Uh, nonetheless, we have done some, made some amazing progress as a country and one of our speakers will talk also globally about some of the advances in environmental justice. The, the themes that you will hear involve meaningful involvement in decision making. How do we assure meaningful involvement? Is it just giving someone a chance to come and listen to something that will be happening? Or do they actually have a chance to change the outcome? Is it procedural justice or is it actually substantive? justice. And sometimes one or the other or a combination of both is what's needed. So I think what we will do today to achieve the ambitious goal that the EPA and our government has set out, that we want a country where no subpopulation bears a disproportionate share of environmental risks and burdens, we're going to have to talk about how do we achieve this outcome we're going to be drawing on a lot of tools, and you'll hear from our speakers about the tools that they have put in place to help realize justice for environmental justice communities. We'll talk about support for technical advisors to the disenfranchised, corporate social responsibility, governmental initiatives both here in the U.S. and abroad. And really today, we want to explore the whole concept of what environmental justice has become today and where we see it going in the future. And with that, I think I would like to introduce our distinguished panel. First, and not in the order in which they're sitting, uh, we have uh, Scott Fulton, the only male up there, so, so Scott stands there. Uh, Scott is the General Counsel of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. It is a great honor to have EPA's top lawyer with us today on this panel. We're delighted that he is with us. He has served in this role, appointed by the President of the United States since 2009, but he is not new to the EPA. In fact, before that, he served as Deputy and Acting Assistant Administrator in the Office of International Affairs. So I know that Scott and Carol will have lots to talk about when it comes to global justice. He's also served as a judge on EPA's Environmental Appeals Board. And I think that that gives Scott some unique uh, perspectives on equity and how we achieve equity. And I'm not gonna read every detail of his bio because it's in your program, but those are some highlights that I thought you would wanna know about Scott. 
and he'll speak first. Uh, then our second speaker uh, will be uh, Daria Neal. Uh, Daria is going to, is with the um, U.S. Department of Justice. And um, I had the great pleasure of meeting Daria about a year ago when we did an um, environmental justice symposium at the University of Mississippi. Uh, Daria has an impressive credential for someone of her young age. She is the Deputy Chief of the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division in the Federal Coordination and Compliance Section. Now that's a big, big title, but what it means is Daria is the head of a team of attorneys who are seeking to promote environmental justice across the government. And she is going to talk about some incredible initiatives that have been taken. We have a big government. That's a topic of lots of discussion these days. Uh, but getting this government moving in one direction when it comes to environmental justice is something that requires a, a firm yet gentle hand. And I think Daria and her colleagues have really made some real changes in how the government is coordinating across agencies on environmental justice. She has uh, previously served as a senior attorney in the Environmental Justice Project with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. So she brings that sort of NGO background. She also has been in private practice and litigated. So again, just this incredible rich background to draw upon on these issues. Our third speaker, uh, Susan Parker Bodine. Susan is at the, the end of the table and is someone who I have seen wear so many hats and every time she wears it, she wears it so well. Um, right now, Susan is in private practice at the law firm of Barnes and Thornburg, where she works on everything from water to solid waste to remediation of contaminated sites and water resources development. She has a lot of practical experience with the private sector right now, with uh, trade organizations on cleaning up and managing sites around the country. But before that, she sat in a, as the assistant administrator at EPA for the Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response. So she was the top official at the agency dealing with uh, CERCLA, RICRA, and our laws dealing with hazardous waste and solid waste in our country, as well as the Superfund program. So she has a lot of practical experience in the government leading our nation in how are we approaching cleanups of hazardous and toxic sites around the country. And before that, she was on the Hill with the legislative um, committee and worked with subcommittee on water resources and the environment and was in the committee of transportation and infrastructure where she drafted legislation, which often is the root of much of what we do, although not in environmental justice. Um, didn't start with a, with a congressional act, uh, but nonetheless, Susan has worn so many hats and she brings that background to our discussions today. Uh, and finally, Carol XL at the World Resources Institute also a legally trained expert based here in Washington. She focuses on access to information, public participation, and access to justice around the world. Uh, she has worked in the Caribbean as the coordinator of freedom of information for the Cayman Islands government. She has developed a model law of information, and we know that information is power, and information is the chance to have equity. So Carol brings us a wide range of experience looking at how, especially in developing countries, we can bring these communities that may not be formally trained in governmental processes or in permitting procedures or even in speaking in front of a podium the way I am today um, and bringing them meaningfully to the table. So we're gonna go domestic to global and we got about an hour and 15 minutes and time for Q&A afterwards. So we're going to talk, uh, each speaker is going to talk for about 10 minutes, maybe a little longer. So stay with us and then we'll pause and we hope that you all will be writing down some questions. And we can make this really interactive and you can ask those questions of our incredible panel today. So thank you for being with us. Thank you again to the university for their help organizing. And with that, I would like to introduce Scott. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be here to talk about such an important topic and with such a distinguished panel. And 
hearing the introductions, I found myself wishing that I had uh, Susan's uh, background and expertise, uh, Daria's age, and uh, um, and uh, Carol's last name. <laughs> uh, in the uh, State of the Union address that the President uh, delivered last month, he described the urgent challenge of keeping alive the shared American story of success, the basic American promise of equal opportunity for all. And he said, and I quote, we can either settle for a country where a shrinking number of people do really well while a growing number of Americans barely get by, uh, or we can restore an economy where everyone gets a fair shot, everyone does their fair share, and everyone plays by the same set of rules. And nowhere uh, do those of us engaged in this work of environmental protection have a more direct and promising opportunity to rise to this challenge than in the effort to secure environmental justice. Uh, your program sets out a definition for environmental justice, although I, um, I agree with Alex, it's, uh, uh, it at times defies definition, but EPA's working definition is similar to the one in the program. We define it as the uh, fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Environmental justice, or EJ, is not a new issue for our agency, but it is certainly a vexing and challenging one, one with which EPA has been struggling uh, for at least half of its life as an institution. Um, I, I thought I'd start us off by offering a, a few additional organizing thoughts, trying to drill down um, a bit more deeply on what environmental justice is and why it is. Um, I'll then share some recent developments at EPA relative to the issue. When we talk about environmental justice, uh, to my way of thinking, we're we're talking generally about the possibility of disparate levels of protection from environmental harms based on economic class, race, or other demographic factors. And this disparate protection, it seems to me, breaks out on two distinct but sometimes connecting planes, susceptibility and exposure. In terms of susceptibility, we are aware that there are subpopulations that have a higher dose response susceptibility to environmental contaminants than experienced by the general public. Children and the elderly are perhaps the most obvious examples, uh, but people who suffer from disease are in poor health or have inadequate access to health care may also have a higher susceptibility. The exposure plane, uh, to my way of thinking, centers principally on the intersection between, between poverty and uh, environmental degradation. Um, with poverty, there tends to flow political impotence and invisibility, a lack of voice, a lack of access, uh, and an educational differential that can produce a sense of helplessness and powerlessness in the face of environmental worries and harms. Uh, with poverty also flows a certain predetermination regarding where you live, where your kids go to school, et cetera. You live in the poorer parts of town where housing is economically accessible to you. You have fewer choices along these lines available to you than do people of means. Now, one of the factors that tends to push down property values and the cost of residential housing, therefore making it more accessible to the poor, is proximity to commercial and industrial zones, highways, and the like. Uh, and there is a cost to such proximity. If you live where the polluting activities in your community are concentrated, your exposure to pollution and the resulting risks may well be greater than the exposure of the non-proximate community. And so we see the potential for disparate environmental burden based on economic class. And in our country, because of our difficult history with race and the differential in economic opportunity that has attended that history, 
uh, we have seen a close relationship historically between economic class and race. And while we've made great strides, I dare say that we as a society have not yet broken fully free from that legacy. And so just as we should not be surprised to see a differential in environmental burden on the basis of economic class, we should likewise not be surprised to see a differential in burden breaking out along the lines of racial identity. And it is uh, of this differential, I think, uh, that we're speaking when we refer to environmental justice. Um, now, I think the environmental justice issue breaks into two principal challenges. Uh, first, um, providing procedural justice, um, uh, as Alex mentioned momentarily ago, and, and second, providing what, what, I, what I've been calling normative justice. I think you used the word substantive justice. Uh, procedural justice uh, contemplates compensating, I think, in some way for the reduced opportunities to participate in environmental decision making that tend to go along with poverty. Uh, more affluent communities have the means uh, to access and process environmental information and the resources to retain counsel, to advocate on their behalf, the means to protect their interests and their rights. Uh, none of this comes readily to the poor community, um, and thus the need to proceed with intention to equalize opportunity for access, engagement, and involvement. Uh, normative justice contemplates addressing the normative implications of differential exposures to pollution. Uh, in other words, if a community is living with a disproportionate pollution burden or is likely to experience a pollution increase as, as a result of new and proximate uh, industrial activity, uh, how can we ensure that their health is not compromised? Uh, beyond the, 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 uh, the basic and ordinarily protective environmental norms, are there circumstances in which additional measures should be considered or required, where the norms themselves should be adjusted to deal with localized anomalies? Um, these qu questions present a, a complex uh, sort of challenge, to be sure. Uh, but notwithstanding their difficulty, we need to, to break through the issues and, and find sensible solutions that are just and that meet our public health and economic needs as a country. Um, so during the, uh, the Obama administration, we've been working on both of these fronts, the procedural justice front and also the normative justice front. Uh, at the very outset of her tenure as EPA administrator, Lisa Jackson identified environmental justice as a key priority and we've been marching to that beat since. Uh, that's what led to the development of EPA's flagship uh, environmental justice roadmap, Plan EJ 2014. Um, that is a comprehensive framework for addressing EPA's environmental justice priorities that, that seeks to integrate EJ considerations into the agency's core business and operating functions. Its areas of focus include uh, rulemaking, permitting, compliance and enforcement, supporting community-based programs, and, and fostering administration-wide action on uh, environmental justice. Um, in addition, uh, EJ, uh, uh, Plan EJ 2014 discusses some specific related initiatives that are underway at EPA, such as the effort to reform EPA's civil rights program, and in particular, its program under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination by intent or in effect based on race, color, and national origin by entities that receive federal financial assistance, um, including most significantly state and local governments. Um, uh, let me focus on one particular area uh, for tool development referenced in EJ Plan uh, 2014. The plan includes a, a charge to my office, the Office of General Counsel, to identify opportunities under EPA's current statutory authorities for advancing environmental justice. Uh, we responded to that charge by recently issuing a document called EJ Legal Tools 
the coordinates for which i believe are referenced in your materials and there are accessible in any case through the agency's web site e j legal tools is a one hundred and eight page overview of discretionary legal authorities available to epa to address environmental justice considerations and various facets of the agency's work importantly this document dispels any notion that federal environmental law and environmental justice are mutually exclusive priorities it rather points to the conclusion that federal environmental law offers ample opportunity to address environmental justice concerns we developed this this instrument principally for the agency's benefit for agency staff and policy makers alike that said we we issued it as a public document as we think it may hold value as a reference point for state and local governments as they consider their own response to the environmental justice challenge and for communities as well notably e j legal tools focuses on epa as the implementer as you know many epa programs are implemented by states in our stead and considering the state role in advancing environmental justice is an important piece of the work that lies ahead but e j legal tools examines as a starting point the role of epa as the implementer under federal environmental law so in this document we we discuss e j relevant authorities available in each of the areas of the agency's programmatic work air water waste toxics and so on and that is how the document is organized but out of that coverage there emerges a number of cross-cutting themes for example one such theme standard setting and rule making as reflected in e j legal tools e j epa has broad authority to consider impacts on affected populations including e j communities and deciding whether to undertake standard setting and in setting the level of a standard for example the national ambient air quality standards under the clean air act allow for consideration of the needs of sensitive subpopulations which can include e j communities in relation to preventing public health risks likewise water quality standards that are designed to protect fish consumption can be set at levels that protect not only the general population but also subpopulations consuming higher levels of fish and shellfish a second thematic area permitting epa permitting statutes typically require public participation in the permitting processes and consideration of the effects of permitted activities on health and the environment and our permitting authorities frequently give epa discretion to consider potential effects on e j populations for example is a provision in the resource conservation and recovery act statute formerly administered by susan section three zero five that that authorizes permit conditions that prevent a facility from posing a threat to health or the environment of the surrounding community which of course can include e j communities another theme information gathering epa's research and information gathering and dissemination authorities under the various statutes give the agency the discretion to focus attention on the particular impacts of regulated activities on on e j communities another theme an important one public involvement as as reflected in the e j legal tools document epa has broad discretion to enable and ensure public participation in environmental decision making and the applicable statutes and regulations often require public notice and the opportunity to comment on a pre-decisional at a pre-decisional stage on a host of actions we have the latitude to implement those authorities in a manner that ensures that potentially overburdened e j communities have full access to available information and truly adequate opportunities to participate in the environmental decision making process a final theme i'll mention is the protection of 
of communities in uh, in tribal country. Uh, this is a, a topic unto its own, but uh, we do discuss in the document the unique circumstances that exist in implementing environmental protection on tribal lands and the opportunities uh, for addressing environmental justice considerations that often arise in that setting. Um, so there's just a very brief uh, overview of, uh, of what's happening at the agency and particularly in the context of this EJ Legal Tools product um, as it uh, reflects, again, um, our environmental laws uh, provide no reason for not responding to environmental justice concerns. Rather, we find them replete uh, with opportunity to ensure the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of, of all people with respect to the development and implementation of environmental requirements and programs. Um, it's our hope uh, that EJ Legal Tools will serve as a reminder of that truth um, and also as a useful reference and uh, a meaningful resource that will uh, enable forward movement in the effort to deliver environmental protection in a manner that's just and equitable. Um, this is uh, an area, an issue uh, on which we are moving with what we hope is great purpose down the path, uh, but we know we have a ways to go. Um, we'll know we've arrived when we can guarantee, really guarantee, uh, that no one's environmental health is compromised because of their race, national origin, or income level, and that all have access uh, both to environmental decision-making processes and to a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Scott, and I noticed during uh, Mr. Fulton's remarks, some of you have joined us from the outside. Please don't hesitate, don't be shy, come on up, there's lots of seats. And also for those of you who are here and need a little caffeine or a little uh, sugar, coffee and uh, sweets are in the back and don't hesitate to get up and, and, and enjoy something uh, while we continue our discussion. And, uh, we will hold questions until after all the speakers, so now I would like to invite our, our second uh, set of opening remarks from uh, Daria Neal with the U.S. Department of Justice, Civil Rights Division. Thank you so much, Daria. That was, that was wonderful, and I think I'm already picking up on a theme, which is collaboration, and you heard all the different partnerships that the Department of Justice has to really make this issue real, and I think that that is is really inherent to environmental justice is that it is um, a core principle with a lot of spokes and you really can't advance it forward without coordination and collaboration. Um, our next speaker, uh, Susan Bodine, is going to, I think, take it down maybe a level and give us some actual case examples, um, positive and maybe some that didn't work as well, but uh, really show us environmental justice on the ground and um, give us something to reflect on. So Susan, welcome. Yes, thank you, Alex. Um, so you've heard Scott and Daria talk about kind of frameworks for environmental justice in decision making. And so as Alex said, I'm gonna talk about some decisions <laughs> that were related to environmental justice. And I, I do have, uh, I guess, you know, three categories, of it, three case examples. Um, the first category I wanna talk about is the Superfund program generally. Uh, Superfund, of course, is about cleaning up uncontrolled releases of hazardous substances. It is site-specific. Those sites have direct effects on the surrounding communities. Uh, that's, you know, clearly there is an EJ component to Superfund. Uh, Superfund cleanups don't necessarily always make everybody happy, but I have to say that the Superfund program does the EJ issue the best of all the programs that I certainly was involved in when I was at EPA. And the reason for that is that it's, it's set up to, in fact, uh, solicit the and uh, obtain the community input that I think you're hearing. Another common theme here is the importance of the, the uh, input from communities in environmental decision making. Uh, Superfund uh, sites have a um, community involvement coordinator so every site will have a person that's, whose job, now they'll have more than one site, they don't have a, 
they don't have an FTE, but they have a person who is their community involvement coordinator and the Superfund program provides money. They provide technical assistance grants, which are money to a group in the community to uh, help facilitate involvement in cleanup decisions. So again, you don't make everybody happy all the time, but as a program, it truly does uh, that, the EJ issues the best. And uh, I want to provide one example of that. Um, it was it's the McAloy site in North Charleston, South Carolina. And of course, um, Superfund cleanup decisions are made at the regional level. The records of decisions are signed by the regional administrator. But I was AA at the time when that site celebrated its, uh, its cleanup as the 1,000th uh, Superfund cleanup in the country. So I got to be the beneficiary of all the good work that everyone else had done. Uh, but it, the reason I want to bring it up is because um, when we went down there to celebrate the cleanup, you know, very many members of the community were there and they were happy. <laughs> so, and they were happy because they, because they were involved in the cleanup decision. They were happy because the remedy was changed based on their input. Um, their, the, and the future development of the property was changed based on their input. There was industrial properties in a residential community and in the future redevelopment, the plans were made such that any future industrial redevelopment was going to be away from, not next to, not abutting the residential community. And so uh, certainly it, 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 inc it increased, you know, not only the environmental protection, but also, you know, the general kind of community life there as well. So again, that was a happy example. Um, the second real world example I want to give is, um, is in the rulemaking context. And I think that this is the most difficult uh, challenge for environmental justice, and that is because rulemakings, rules are of general applicability. So it's not site specific. It's, you know, it is a rule that applies nationally. First point. Second point, rules, uh, EPA, in fact, is charged under the statutes that it, that the agency carries out to protect human and health and the environment. And so when the agency write ru writes rules, the agency writes rules that are protective of human health and the environment. Um, so the case I want to talk about is the definition of solid waste. There was a final rule in October 2008. Uh, there's a new proposal that's pending right now. Uh, in that, that rule was about, um, was actually in response to a series of DC circuit opinions that pertain to what is the scope of EPA's authority over recycled hazardous materials. Are they wastes, which gives you authority under RCRA, or are they not wastes, in which case EPA has no authority? Uh, and so, so Re RCRA, Research Conservation and Recovery Act, allows EPA to regulate wastes. It doesn't actually allow the agency to prevent a material from becoming a waste. Its authority, the agency's authority kicks in after a material is already a waste, which of course is an entirely, incredibly complex issue. But the rule, we, the agency was criticized uh, on the definition of solid waste rule in 2008 for environmental justice concerns. Um, the concern was raised that uh, because there was material that previously had been regulated as hazardous waste, which would now no longer be regulated, that, that that presented an EJ concern. Now, the EJ issues certainly came up during the rulemaking context. Sierra Club wrote extensive comments on it. And um, we talked about it in the, in the development of the rule. And the um, and in fact the record in the in the rulemaking reflects you know the agency's analysis there and the um, particularly in the regulatory impact analysis that accompanies the rule the RIA and what what we did in that rule was we had uh, two studies we had a study of um, we had our bad recycling study and our good recycling study so there was a study of damage cases associated with hazardous substance recycling and and another study of positive examples. And so in developing the rule, the staff went through all of the damage cases, identified the underlying cause of the damages, and then in crafting the rule, put in conditions to address the underlying causes of the damages that were identified in the damage study. So in the, in the final rule that was issued, um, of course, you go through your language at the end saying, I, I met all these executive orders. And of course, one of the executive orders is the executive order um, 12898, and the rule says, based on the analysis that's supported by the regulatory impact analysis that's in the docket, um, there, is, there isn't an environmental justice issue here. And um, I think Daria read the pertinent language to you from the executive order, but the language says, 
of the executive order says um, there has to be an adverse human health and environmental effect, and then um, you look and see whether that adverse effect is disproportionately high on your low income and minority populations. And in that rule, um, we certified that there wasn't an adverse effect because in fact the rule included the conditions to prevent an adverse effect from happening, and in fact because agency rules are supposed to be protective of human health in the environment and of everybody. Uh, so fast forward, um, uh, peti petition to reopen the rule being granted, new rule being proposed. The new rule is based on an, on an environmental justice analysis. Now here's, I mean, I, and I have to say, I, I take issue with the EJ analysis that was, that's done to perform the new rule. And the reason is because that both the regulatory impact analysis and the EJ analysis for the rule which is pending, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it was proposed, it's not yet final, uh, assumes noncompliance. So basically the analysis is as follows. We're, we're going to assume that, um, that the regulated community doesn't comply with regulations. And therefore we're going to assume that there is an adverse environmental impact and therefore we'll do our EJ analysis and we'll assume, you know, what communities might be affected and then we'll look and see if it's dis disproportionately high and adverse. And the conclusion of the study was yes, there's an EJ issue here uh, and that there would be a disproportionately high and adverse human health and environmental effect on low income and minority populations based on those series of assumptions. The concern I have with the analysis is that you can't, if you assume, if you assume noncompliance, then you can justify any regulation whatsoever. I mean, the assumed noncompliance with a set of existing regulations was used to justify imposing more regulation, which I guess then we assume there would be compliance with. <laughs> so, so there's, I, I think that um, EJ in the rulemaking context is very difficult for the agency and uh, is something, I mean, I think uh, definition of solid waste was the first time they'd actually tried to do it. Um, it's, it it's a challenge. Um, the, the third and last example I want to use what is a um, petition. So it's, was, it's uh, case specific. And this is a petition that was um, sought by a company called Veolia in Port Arthur, Texas, which is a low income minority community. And the request was to import, uh, uh, authority to import 20,000 tons of PCB waste from Mexico to Port Arthur so that it could be disposed of in the Tosca permanent incinerator uh, located there which meets the um, standards under Tosca which is six nines. So the um, destruction removal efficiency is 99.9999. Um, that issue came to me in my office when at the very end of the process because the dis PCB disposal authority had been transferred from the toxics office to Oz were, you know, at right in the middle of this petition. So, so both the OPPTS staff and the Osworth staff were involved. But I have to say they, particularly the, you know, the people who were involved in developing this and evaluating the petition felt very passionately about the need to get this material into the United States and destroy it. There is no disposal capacity in Mexico. It was being stored indefinitely. And the concern that was being raised was the essentially uncontrolled situation that was present in Mexico of the 20,000 tons of PCB material um, and, that, and the conclusion and the recommendation which I agreed with and I signed the proposal uh, to grant the petition was that the environmentally favorable thing to do in this situation was to grant the petition and allow the material to be incinerated in the United States. Um, Right, bef right w when it came down to the wire there, I did, I had, in Osworth there is a, an EJ um, advisor and, at, you know, and he hadn't been involved in the earlier discussions. He raised the EJ issue at the last minute and I asked about it and the answer was, and uh, was basically the, um, the permit, the, 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 the volume that was going to be imported was within the permitted amount for the facility and that therefore there wasn't a new 
burden on the community. It was already within the permitted amount. And I, I accepted that explanation and went ahead and, and uh, you know, we, we went forward with, again, it was a proposal. It was a proposal to grant the petition that went out for notice and comment. Um, and there was a lot of adverse comment on, on the EJ issue. And I think, I think, in retrospect, we made a big mistake not doing a full-blown EJ analysis, even though the, the volume was within the permitted capacity of the facility. So there wasn't an increased burden from a legal standpoint. It was already permitted. But from a public standpoint, there was. Um, you know, they could have taken the 20,000 tons from anywhere in the United States. There wouldn't have been an issue. Um, no petition, no, 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 no authority needed. It was already in their permit. But because it was an import from Mexico, there was a, a step of granting a petition under TSCA. And um, given that circumstance, you know, I, I would say we should have done uh, done more on the EJ side in, in that particular instance. Um, the, the, you know, the end of that story is that um, the furor that was raised about that led the company to uh, withdraw the petition. So I can only presume that the 20,000 tons of material are still in storage in Mexico. Thank you, Susan. <coughs> Very, um, Sobering, really, because um, when you speak about these principles at a very high level, it, 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 there's so many things that, are, that feel right about it. And then when you hear particular case studies like that one, I mean, of course we want proper disposal of hazardous materials. We don't want them lying in, in countries that don't have the capacity. And yet, um, do, do we want to accept the waste from another country? And is that putting some burden that that community wouldn't have otherwise experienced? Um, and so when we talked a little bit about how this panel might go today, we thought this might be a nice segue uh, to, to Carol XL, who is uh, bearing a, a heavy and disproportionate burden today to talk about global justice uh, because and this really came home to me when I taught a class in environmental justice, and it was all about procedures and notice and comment rulemaking and administrative procedures. And I had some students from other countries in the class. And um, after about the second lecture, they came up to me and they said, this is all very interesting, but none of this happens in our country. And, and when are you, you know, you're assuming that we have these procedures, that we have access to information, that we have rights to raise these questions in our country, and we don't. Um, and there were people from um, former Soviet Union nations, there were people from African countries, there were people from um, Madagascar. So it really reminded me that we think of environmental justice, sometimes we think about it domestically, and that a full picture of justice really requires to think about it in a global sense. And so, so Carol is going to talk about the global perspective, and I, I think it will all come together in, in a way, because there's some common themes, too. So welcome. Okay, thank you very much, and I think I also will sit here, um, just to be different from my colleague, Scott. <laughs> um, started that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much as well to the Catholic University. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Just to say a little bit about where I work. Um, I work with the World Resources Institute, and it is a think tank um, it, uh, situated here in Washington, D.C., but we really are an in international institution. And uh, the area that I work in is on governance, and I work as part of a civil society network of activists all around the world working to bring voice, to increase public participation and access to justice in their own communities. And so I um, actually work as a secretary at this network. Um, it's really my privilege um, to be a part of it. Um, it, it, it also um, allows me to both use my environmental lawyer skills, but also more importantly in this aspect to talk about transparency, public participation and accountability, which are so key around the world. Um, I, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the, what work we do because it fits in so well with um, this theme. Um, our partners have been working for the last 10 years in countries and all over, all over the world um, to, to try and see how we can push governments to implement what we call as Principle 10 of the Rio Declaration. So Principle 10 of the Rio Declaration, I'm sure you all know it, and I'm waiting for nodding heads. Uh, well, Principle 10 um, <laughs> it was, you know, in 1992, 
We had the amazing Earth Summit. I'm sure you've all heard of it in, in Brazil, in Rio. Um, now more famous for a cartoon about Rio and birds, but um, Rio is happening again this year, and the, uh, and the, the, the Rio Declaration was um, agreed at that time, adopted by, oh, I think, over 140 countries. As Basically, it says that environmental issues are best handled with the participation of all citizens, and states really have to facilitate that access to information about hazardous, information, uh, hazardous substances and ensure that citizens have effective remedy before the court. So this was done a number of years ago. States all the, over the world committed to it. And, and our network has been working for the last 10 years to assess our countries really putting in place laws, policies, and practices to make this real for their citizens. Um, about five years ago, though, we um, noting all the amazing work that has been done in the U.S., we determined that what the work we were doing, we needed to go further. Um, and I brought copies of the publication that we, we did, uh, which was done last year. It's called Seat at the Table. And we, we changed the way we looked at the issue by looking more at, even if in, in countries they've adopted new rights of access to information or public participation, or even developed environmental courts, are these... Um, legal changes, these reforms and policies, new policies and practice, really allowing people in poverty to be able to have a part um, to play and uh, have their voice heard in decision making about decision making about the environment. So this publication actually looks at some of the obstacles facing the poor in developing countries around the world. Um, and whether or not people enjoy these rights that we talk about here and often take for granted, as Alexandra said, in the developed world, that you have a right to, to you know, wave your hands and participate in decision makings of the government. Do we have a right to, in rule making, to have our voice heard? These things, I think, are almost taken for granted here, but in other countries, these rights do not exist at all. Um, so we looked at a number of case studies, and I hope you get a chance to, to look at the publication. It was um, in the paper, and we brought copies. We looked at countries, Cameroon, Paraguay, Philippines, and Sri Lanka. We looked at cases about communities in poverty in the Philippines who had mining tailings released into rivers used by their households for water, whether or not they had access to information, access to justice. We looked at poor communities in Cameroon, um, where they um, d were, were they able to have information about the water in their local standpipes um, in regions that had the highest percentage of waterborne diseases? Um, were local communities in Paraguay able to get comp compensation for a huge agrochemical spill in Paraguay? We looked at a number of different, there's probably over 20 case studies, and we came up with some recommendations and findings based on that. And what we found out that there is really more acceptable acceptance universally, universally um, that pr you know, principles of access to information, public participation, and access to justice are important in countries around the world. I mean, there's been great growth over almost 90 countries around the world now have freedom of information laws. You have EIAs in almost every country in the world. Um, whether or not they allow citizens to participate, well, of course, is another issue, but you do have most of them recognizing that there should be some par public participation. In most countries, it's not mandatory, but there are provisions. Um, even environmental courts, all around the world, there are environmental courts now. Um, but what we have looked at in our study, and quite clearly, is that these existing standards still um, do not make ac access more available for communities that are living in poverty, and do, they're still not delivering access to the poor. And really, more needs to be done. And if you look at the recommendations in that book, you'll see that some of them really touch on environmental justice principles that the U.S. has actually um, created a framework, a legal, a policy and practice framework around. Um, interestingly enough, I so spoke about principle 10 of the Rio Declaration. It was actually the US government that introduced this principle. And so there is a lot of history um, here. And I would say, my own personal opinion, is there is a lot of weight now in the US to live up to that principle internationally. It's not good enough to look at it as a principle made in 1992, but you introduced it, you have a leadership role, you have developed policies, practices, legislation that really ensure that you know, communities have an opportunity to have a voice in this country. And I think it's important for those principles to go worldwide. They are so important, not only in this country, but all around the world. So we've heard of the amazing progress that has been made, the new tools, 
the amazing collaboration with federal governments all over the world. I mean, has this, has this sort of learning transferred into countries developing, into the developing world? I would say that the EPA has done a good job so far um, internationally uh, I mean, trying to introduce these um, principles, but more needs to be done. We are also working with our partners um, for, for right now, the most important country we're working with is actually Chile. Chile really interestingly has done a huge amount of reform of their environmental laws. Um, just last year, they introduced a new law on environmental impact assessments, and we work with our partners in Chile to introduce the concept of environmental justice into their regulations. Um, to talk about the importance of institutions demonstrating that there is no impact, or to address issues of communities of poverty, um, and ensure that there is in, um, public participation by communities, indigenous people, poor women in the EIA process. So there's now a draft rule in Chile that actually speaks to those issues. And this is just one country in Latin America. When we look at where other countries are, they have still not reached that level. It's, it, it's a work in progress. It's, it's each country individually having to deal with reform of their laws to start addressing these issues. Um, so you can imagine how much work has to be done um, in the developing world. So my message really here today, I'm not going to talk too long, is that the U.S. has really uh, made a lot of progress in this area. Internationally, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, if you can see from the publication that we did, I think there is a great opportunity this year for the Obama in administration to really provide leadership in this regard. I'm sure that you all know that in four months' time, um, there will be the next to Rio Plus 20, the Rio Conference on Environment and Development, Sustainable Development, um, going to be held in Brazil. Um, there is already a zero draft. It's been called like a zero draft. This is where we're going to move from to get to the final document, which countries are now um, putting forward their ideas about what does, what are, the, how do we ensure sustainable development going forward. Um, and so I think it's really important. There's not been a lot of press about Rio Plus 20. I've heard more about uh, the World Cup and all these other things that are going to be happening in Brazil, but you know, very little publicity about Rio Plus 20, but it's really, really important. Um, the Zero Draft already speaks to the necessity of eradication of all forms of poverty and inequality and striving for a world which is just, equitable, and inclusive. And to me, those words sound amazing, but there's always the fear that they're just platitudes to us all who are interested in justice issues. And that how do we ensure that this conference, which brings leaders from all over the world together to talk about sustainable development, how do we ensure that they practice what they preach and that environmental justice issues are on the table? Um, the draft has some very interesting provisions, and I hope you all take an opportunity to, to look at it and talk to your government about what you think should be included in this. It talks about, for example, the idea of sustainable development goals. How do we look at, instead of just looking at the Millennium Development Goals, how do we create goals around sustainable development for the world? Um, should there be sustainable development goals on environmental justice? Uh, I think so, there's an opportunity there. The draft also, for example, speaks about commitments that government, civil society, and companies can make internationally in a compendium of commitments. Um, this provision was also put in by the U.S. government, so it's really an opportunity as well, I think, here to get real commitments about how do we take some of this learning that has been done in the U.S. and bring it to other countries. I think it's really, really critical. I've worked in a number of countries around the world that are vastly industrializing, and the communities are suffering, really suffering. So it's something that's very important. Um, and lastly, um, there are um, even a section of the draft on principle 10 and how do we ensure implementation of principle 10. And so hopefully the language can be made even stronger to ensure that we can have full implementation of this principle, which really speaks to environmental justice um, around the world and a program of activities that makes it real for communities. So um, I'm just, my message really is um, there's history here, there's leadership in the past, and we're really excited to see continued leadership of the U.S. at Rio Plus 20 on the issue of environmental justice. Thank you. Well, I hope, uh, thank you, Carol. I, I, I wrote down your, when you said just, equitable, and inclusive, and the whole time as I've listened to this panel, I think about what um, Many of us as lawyers, this whole panel is loyal, lawyers, maybe not everyone in the audience is lawyers, but certainly as 
as, pe as people who have been trained in the legal system, that it, those are principles that we are, are really obligated to uphold, justice, fairness, equity, and achieving that in an area that is so uh, unique and personal to each individual and each community is a great challenge. And I think we've heard a little bit about how much it's going to take over time to make this real, to not just talk about it in our own country and abroad, but to actually bring it home and change decisions. Uh, and I commend the Seat at the Table publication to you all. Um, it is uh, really inspiring and the work of Carol's organization, the World Resources Institute, is, is truly a, a great resource for these communities in developing countries. Um, with that, I have to thank all of my wonderful speakers because they left exactly the amount of time we hope to have for questions and answers. And I believe I see uh, the gentleman in the beautiful red tie with a microphone ready. And I know you all are not going to make me go to my canned <laughs> questions here <laughs> that we already worked out answers to. Give us something from the floor. <laughs> so, and, and you will bring the microphone. Did I see a young woman in the front here? Please use the microphone Stop. so everyone can hear you. Okay. Hi. Uh, so my first question is for Susan. This relates to the third case that you were talking about, the uh, disposal. Mm -hmm. um, is that an isolated incident, or is there like is there a structured methodology to dealing with these kind of issues? Have have you confronted them in your tenure? So. This, this particular one was an isolated incident because as a general matter, um, you know, import of PCBs are, it, is banned under TSCA, but there's a petition process to allow it. Um, in terms of, uh, is there a process? Well, yes, there, there's the executive order process, which requires an EJ review of a decision of the agency, but it's triggered, as, as I had mentioned, by a determination that the decision would cause an ad, a disproportionate adverse impact on the minority or um, low-income population. And in, this, in that case, we didn't use the EJ tools because uh, the decision was made that, there, that, that that import decision didn't create that adverse impact. Now, in retrospect, um, we should have used the EJ tools, should have done the outreach, and the outcome may have been different. So it, it really goes to the whole seat at the table theme here. Um, you can get a better environmental outcome w when you use those tools. And this is true for other pollutants as well? So this wouldn't be limited to uh, PCBs, you said? This well, so yes. I mean, the, the, the executive order applies to all agencies across the government. Okay. Um, so yes, it would apply to any, where you had an agency decision that triggered it. But, uh, but I have to, but let me point out, it is an executive order. As right. has been pointed out here before, it's not law. And so the executive order and whatever environmental justice analysis you do can inform the exercise of discretion. Uh, that the agency, any agency would have. It can't expand authority. So the agency still has to stay within whatever the confines of whatever program it's working under. Uh, sorry to keep going, but, but sure. uh, is there any geographical limitations? Like this was Mexico, it just happened, to, you know, it just mm -hmm. happens that it's uh, right next door, but are there any limitations? So for example, if some other country were to do, were to reach out, there are no limitations? Um, you mean to import or yes, export? To, yep, 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 yep. Well, the issue usually comes up right now under as exporting, um, mm -hmm. and actually it's PCBs again, and it has to do with ship dis dismantling. And so we have situations right now where we have what we call ghost fleets mm -hmm. that are leaking and into our waterways, all kinds of toxic chemicals, but we can't necessarily export them <laughs> to another country to get them dismantled. So there are other examples like that, um, but. Uh, yeah, and, and that's actually, that's, so that's a reverse example. Yeah, where? Yeah, I come from a place of ignorance, so okay. forgive me. If sure, that, that's then, all right, that's you know, all right. completely silly question. And my final question is for you, uh, Scott. Um, is there any database um, that's maintained, or is there any um, effort, like, going forward to identify these vulnerable communities that you were talking about? That's, a, that's a, an interesting and good question. There actually is uh, an effort underway to uh, develop a tool uh, that would serve as a, a screening mechanism that would 
um, uh, allow for aggregation of demographic information and environmental information, including information like where the permitting fa permitted facilities are, uh, what we know um, about their uh, pollution contributions, uh, and the like, um, as, a, as a tool principally for uh, uh, regional offices and state entities that are implementing environmental programs, so they can, uh, uh, with a fairly uh, 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 quick um, uh, check-in at their, at their PC, uh, bring up information that would be relevant to letting you know uh, from the very get-go uh, what the nature of the community is that uh, that this activity is contemplated within. Mm -hmm. So you said that it's something that's underway. Uh, yes, well underway, but uh, we're not. Uh, I don't. Th we're is not. Is it publicly available? No, or not yet. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm it looking will be. at Lisa Garcia. Yeah. Here. yeah. <laughs> We've talked about it a lot, and we think there is a need for this kind of a. Of a, of a tool. And yeah, I would uh, expect if, you know, if, if the vulnerable communities are, you know, easily identifiable, it, you know, uh, it would make sense that any kind of outreach efforts or any kind of, you know, implementation would be easier when you know um, what the target we, community is. We agree, is. and we're <laughs> trying to get there. Okay, all right, thank you. Excellent questions, excellent questions. I see a woman in the pink there. Um, does the tool have a name, and could you just tell us <laughs> about where, where you are in developing it? Uh, what is our time horizon? Do you know, Lisa? Uh, so, the initial decision is not until 2021. Uh, we made a decision in 2013, and as far as the plan is that it's one for high school girls. Mm. If you look online, <coughs> sorry, the plan is that it's high school girls, and what our implementation objective will include a description of where we're going. And I'm delighted to see so many hands up. There's someone right behind you, yeah. Hi, um, do uh, the panelists, do you all think that it might be better or worse if instead of just an executive order, there was an actual EJ statute to work within the confines of? Mm -hmm. I, I might take a, a crack at that because I've, um, I recently um, worked on a, a law review article that, that questioned that in the beginning. And um, right now there are many states that will have statutes um, that do mandate some particular um, procedures. There have been, I believe, two efforts to get federal law on environmental justice passed that have been unsuccessful. Um, that, that's, so would it be helpful though? It, it, it could, it could be, if, if, well, if well drafted and, um, all the other things that go with legislation. <laughs> I mean, Susan, you were a, le a, le a you drafted just, legislation. Right, so. and I've actually sat in committee markups where EJ amendments were offered to the Clean mm -hmm. Water Act and were voted down. And the debate went as, the, the debate uh, uh, against the amendment, the argument was, um, we're about protecting the human health of everybody and not just particular communities and that that's what our environmental statutes say and that we shouldn't be saying that the goal of the statute is to have the, you know, is, is, is that there is a disproportionate and adverse effect and that therefore we need to do the EJ reviews. And so um, I, I guess I personally would say I agree with the principle that, that we should be protecting everybody's health and environment and the environment everywhere. And EJ really is about how you get there rather than an independent right because the right, you know, in terms of the way our statutes are written, they are to be protected. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that, um, I mean, I think that there could be some benefit to having a statute that clearly outlines what environmental justice means um, and how activities, what activities can be used to um, ensure that disparity doesn't um, either isn't um, isn't perpetuated. Um, we know that 75% of hazardous waste facilities in this country are located in minority and low-income communities. 
And so despite the fact that you know, all of our laws are supposed to be enforced and enforced equally, it appears that that's not the case just by looking at where people live in proximity to toxic facilities. So, um, I mean, I think that the political will to do, to have such a statute is, is not there. Um, and I don't know when it would be there, because I think it would be a very um, complicated conversation to have. Um, how, it, how would you define environmental justice? We talked about how you know, communities define environmental justice for themselves. And you know, I teach an environmental justice class at Howard, and actually just last night, I asked my students, what is your definition of environmental justice, and got five different definitions. Um, so how can you expect Congress to come up with one? Um, not saying that that's not possible, but um, there are a lot of complicated and, and um, difficult substantive legal issues, I think, that would come up in the conversation. And frankly, there may be um, more opportunity and more freedom for agencies to address uh, disproportionate burdens now than if you had a, a particular statute that tried to um, define and confine what um, what activities could be conducted to address the disparities? Uh, I, uh, I kind of share the view that the question is uh, probably more of an academic one than a, um, than, uh, a real one because it would be very uh, challenging, I think, to see that kind of a legislative effort through um, among the, uh, the public policy issues that are uh, embedded there and that would have to be addressed is the whole uh, intersection um, between federal legislation and local land use planning. And uh, you know, our environmental statutes reflect a certain allergy uh, by the Congress of the United States to interfering in local land use planning decisions. And um, that point of intersection, I think, is a very difficult one. Um, and I also agree with Derry. I, I, I think it would be difficult um, to uh, successfully prescribe through legislation exactly how to administer environmental justice. Uh, I think we're still figuring it out. Um, and I think it's through the figuring it out and, uh, and proceeding stepwise uh, and taking uh, some chances and risks and trying to administer justice that we will collectively uh, arrive at a much better understanding of what uh, environmental justice means um, in this uh, complex set of I issues and interests within which we operate. Um, and just for the international perspective, I, th I think that um, it is critical that um, some of these, it, I don't think it, like a wholesale framework law would be ex you know, acceptable in many countries, but I think in um, like EIA laws or uh, other laws that deal with permitting, there are a lot of opportunities to put in procedural rights that look at people who are indigenous, poor, women, and how you can ensure their involvement, participation, and voice. I think that's the way that it can be incorporated, incorporated successfully in, in, con in developing countries. Um, and I think the example of Chile is a great one to look at, and hopefully Chile as a leader in Latin America can help develop that. Um, already you can see with indigenous people's rights, there are a lot more provisions in, in laws on indigenous people that require um, consent and notification, consultation um, on the procedural rights side, and I think we can learn a lot from that um, going forward in environmental laws, sectoral environmental laws. Great question, thank you so much. I think we have time, I don't know if these programs typically run over, but maybe we'll take about three more questions and then the panelists might be able to stick around for a little bit longer to answer any final questions. So I don't know how, to, how I think I have to skew a little bit to the right. So I saw the lady in blue and then we'll come back this way. And you could do what a third grader does and you know, ooh, 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 ooh. You know? Thank you. <laughs> Susan, I think you brought this up, but I'll address it to all of the panelists and, and Daria. Looking at EJ and rulemaking can be difficult. So if you had to offer recommendations or considerations on how that could better be done, what, would, what advice or what would you offer to give us? And I would address it to all the panelists. Let me answer. I, I asked that question. I, af <laughs> when there were, you know, after the deficits always came out and there was a lot, there was, you know, a concern about the EJ implications. Um, mm -hmm. I asked that question of a friend of mine who's on the NEJAC, the National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee that advises, obviously, EPA. And the response I got was, 
you sh was really the part to seat at the table response was whether or not um, you know yes it's national applicability yes you know you it's 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 different than a permit where you have a, or a Superfund site where you have a site specific impact but you still need to do the outreach and the participation and uh, so that um, that you get you know the full uh, expansive mm -hmm. views from from all from whatever communities that might feel they might be impacted and that, um, that that we didn't do because we thought we were being protective of everybody and that um, that we, had we done that, again, we could, yeah, maybe it would have changed the rule, I don't know. Uh, again, that's a good question and since I don't know the answer to that question, that in and of itself says, you know, that there was a process error. Um, but that I think would be the rec my recommendation as well. I don't know if, um, if, if anyone, we don't have time sadly for any more questions, but I do wanna let, the other panelists if they wanted to comment on that last question. Other thoughts? <laughs> See, I'm not in the agency, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I don't wanna cut us short, but any final thoughts? Um, well, just to say that there's a lot of variability between the programs that are uh, administered that bear on this and they're uh, I think there uh, are rulemaking activities that can more consciously address this issue just because of the nature of the program. Big difference between the waste program and the air program, for example. Uh, in the air program, we, uh, in one of our national ambient air quality standard rules for NO2, uh, we found ourselves thinking about where we place the monitors by which we determine whether an area is in attainment. Um, and it was really the EJ question that inspired that thought and ended up producing the solution, which was we were going to have at least some monitors very consciously placed near, near highways um, so that we would get a better purchase on the localized pollution situation rather than just relying on area monitors as our means of telling us whether an area was meeting the health standard or not. So. Um, I think, um, I think we just have to force ourselves to confront the question on a rule by rule basis. In some circumstances, it will uh, possibly lead us to a slightly different place and where we would have landed without having asked the question. But the important thing is to, uh, to challenge ourselves with the question and, and see where it carries. Well, I can't think of sager advice to end our discussion. And I thank all of you for sharing your evening with us. I thank Dean Miles and all the folks at the law school who helped put this together and all of the co-sponsoring organizations, the wonderful panel. And um, please en enjoy a refreshment before you go on your evening journey home. And um, we hope that today, if your eyes I, I sense most people's eyes were already open to these issues and that's why you're here. But maybe with what we learned today, we can open a few more. So thank you very much. <laughs>